Mike Kim, the Boss Man Show here with Matt Langle, the coach of the Colgate Raiders here with me, uh, the Patriot, Patriot League. Coach, what's up, man? Hey, how are you doing? Good to be back on. I appreciate you guys having me. Yes, indeed. Coach, uh, I'll tell you what, man, I'm ask you this. Uh, you're in the middle of year nine, Coach, leading the Raiders. Uh, what do you feel like has been your greatest accomplishment in your nine years leading the Colgate Raiders, man? Yeah, I appreciate you asking me that question. I think that at 34 years old, um, you know, uh, the the staff and I inherited a program uh, that was on a little bit of hard times. I think they had, we had won just eight games. And, uh, you know, at the time, the school record for wins was 18 on a, on a regular season. So uh, I think I'm most proud that we've, you know, we feel like we've built a program that, um, you know, is positioned well, not just for this season, but for the future to be in the hunt for, uh, conference championships in the regular season, uh, and 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 making the postseason a, a reality. Yeah, Coach. Like I said being there nine years in the, in the coaches business, we, we and you both know this. It, it, the turnover is so high every spring. To be in some a one place nine years, man, you got to have the alignment of the AD, the president, and, and the basketball coach to be be on one accord to make sure that you can get the support to be there nine straight years as you have so far. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point that you make. I, um, you know, I, I've we've been fortunate to. First of all, we were fortunate that the institution and the alumni and the board of trustees and the administration were patient because you know, it wasn't. We didn't turn it around, uh, you know, right away. We only, you know, we, we didn't win ten games in the first year, and then, um, you know, thirteen, and it took a handful of years before we even had a winning record. Um, so, uh, you know, the patience is important. I think that. You know, it wasn't just uh, for Colgate. It wasn't just about wins and losses. You know, those who have stayed here for four years have all graduated, and there are a lot of other things, good things we are guys are doing in the classroom uh, and in the community. Um, you know, I have worked with three different athletic directors and had a couple of different presidents. And again, I think that piece the, um, you know, the the, the, uh, the mission of the institution that I, I'm privileged to work at. That you know, it's not just about wins and losses. Um, but there's there's other things that are really important to, you know, educating young people and, and providing opportunities and a uh, rallying point for, for both current stu- students and you know, alumni to you know, support something that, yeah, hopefully you can compete for championships, but also that you know, you're developing uh, solid young men who are going to be leaders in their fields and work for a while. Yeah, I think that the charge um, and how we attack off season is just that we're always trying to get better. Um, you know, that's, you know, for me first, I'm trying to be a better coach, uh, trying to you know, find other people, be it people in the NBA or other college programs who, you know, have seen over a period of time. And what do they do and how do they manage their programs and act to their program and, and grow their programs? Just so how do we, how do we improve? And so, you know, we talk to players about that all the time, but I think if, you know, we're not looking at ourselves in the mirror as, as coaches of saying, how, how do we become better? How do we, you know, give our guys some, some new stuff that they'll be excited about or maybe tweak some of the things we do on offense or defense? you know, based on the, the group that we're returning, because no college program returns the exact same team um, from one year to the next. And while we re- we're we're going to return a, a lot of the most uh, guys who logged the most minutes and scored the most points, but we knew we would be a different team. So I think you start to work on some of those things of what your identity is going to be, how you, how you, you know, keep what, what is really relevant to your success, but also how you, you know, maybe cha- make some changes based on your, your new personnel or the personnel that's exited. Uh, so we did that. We were fortunate enough that we had a trip to Italy in August. Um, so we were able to take the new group uh, across the ocean and see some things and get some practices in, which was important basketball-wise, but uh, really start to get to know each other and, and see where that new leadership was going to come from and how those relationships were going to come together. Uh, because I think at the college level, that that's as important as anything. Obviously, uh, you need to have good X's and O's and, and good um, schemes for your guys to have some success on the court. Uh, but how they get along and how they come together and how they work for one another and how hard they're playing for the guy on their left and their right really at the end of the day um, makes all the difference. Hey, Coach, just as says so for Colgate, uh, uh, how has it been for you rec- recruiting wise to get young men up in the tri-state area uh, up there in New York and Northeast to come to Colgate and want to be a part of what you're building there that you've built over the past nine years? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it, we, we've had a lot of different avenues of success. I mean, there's, it's, um, you know, we're, we're not afraid to talk about it. There's not a lot of young people um, across the country who, when we call them representing Colgate University and as the men's basketball program, that they, um, that they say, oh, coach, this is a dream come true. I've been, I've been waiting my whole life to have the chance to go play 
go play college ball at Colgate University in upstate New York the way they might at, like, say, Kentucky or North Carolina or Duke or wherever it might be. Um, so, you know, we've had to work really hard to find the right guys for, you know, the small school that we are. Uh, we've had to find guys who, you know, value education and, and are really want the opportunity to be a Division One player and work really hard in the classroom um, uh, and on their academics outside the classroom. Um, and so that's coming a lot of different ways. I mean, we've got uh, guys from California, guys from Texas. Uh, we've had a couple, uh, we've had a number of guys uh, who have, uh, we've been their second institution, meaning they've uh, gone the transfer route that, you know, for whatever reason, it wasn't the right fit at their first school. Uh, and they've come here and sat out a year and worked really hard and uh, improved as players and gotten, felt, and gotten in a good rhythm with our, our coaches and our, our program. So I think there's been a lot of different ways that we've been uh, successful. Um, you know, we've got a senior, uh, Will Raymond, who um, – you know, just went over the 1700 point eight eight uh, 800 rebound mark, and he's one of five guys in the history of the Patriot League to do it. And you know, he didn't really have a lot of other Division One recruiting, so um, you know, and I give him a lot of credit. He's improved a lot over his career. I give our staff a lot of credit because they kind of found him and evaluated him, and there weren't a lot of other uh, Division One programs out there that did it. Uh, and now that we've had some success, we're you know we were able to sign three guys early that we're really excited about. Who you know we identified as guys we think can be really good. And you know in past years where maybe they would have chosen another school that that hadn't yet gotten to that NCAA tournament, uh, they were comfortable going with us this year. And hopefully they can help us continue to to compete at a high level uh, in our conference moving forward. Now, Coach, you've got nine wins in non-conference play before you got into the pitch league play. So talk about that, having to get those nine wins in non-con, knowing when you're going to go on the road a lot, can't get as many home games as you would like, have to travel a lot, and play play a guarantee too. So talk about getting nine wins, knowing all those things, factors that, that go into non, the non-con schedule and scheduling in general to get those nine wins that make you feel real, real good. Yeah, it's a complicated process for sure. And you say a, a guaranteed game or two, or I'll throw out there, you know, if you look at our schedule, uh, three in a row, and then a fourth um, when we when we played at Cincinnati a little bit later in the season. So, um, yeah, a number of things go into scheduling for us. I think the first one, um, you know, is we we we've got to be really cognizant of of our our academic schedule. Um, you know, what the, the rigors that our guys take on. Um, you know, there's a reason that that uh, our our alumni network is so successful, and um, you know, the people that graduate here get such good jobs and you know, make the amount of money that they do after school. It's because the, the degree isn't easy. And, uh, and they're, they learn a lot and are talented, you know, academic people. Um, so, you know, we've got to be, you know, cognizant of not having our guys miss too much class time. So that part of the scheduling, meaning you, you can't always travel too far in the middle of the week. And uh, you've got to kind of balance that out. Uh, the other part that you mentioned was, yeah, we, we do play some guarantee games. Some of that is, is bringing in some, um, you know, significant money for the athletic department as a whole. Uh, but the other part, to be honest with you, is, uh, you know, I, I don't know how, how you guys feel, but when I was a kid growing up, you know, I wanted to play on the biggest stage under the brightest lights. That's part of what was so exciting for me about college basketball is, you know, it's not like, you know, football where, um, you know, not everybody gets a chance to go against the, the Clemsons and the Florida State and the um, and the Texases. But, you know, in basketball, you know, no matter what level you're at, you, you chance that if your coaches do it that you get a chance to play in some of those games so you know we recruit to that i mean we want guys who want to play on those stages so you know the fact that we play syracuse every year and you know it just so happened that it was it was it was clemson auburn syracuse and back to back in you know one week's time made it a little bit tough on our group but you know our guys that was that was one of their goals going into the year they wanted to really be competitive in those games and find a way to win so you know they were super excited that one of those nine wins we were able to you know, play Cincinnati at Cincinnati and, and get out of there with a win in, in somewhat of a crazy fashion. But, um, you know, you, you want to your coach memories in that regard. And so playing those games um, in that non-league and, you know, it's also preparation, meaning if you're going against the best, you kind of get exposed sometimes as to what you need to work on. And because if you're going to get into March, then, uh, you know, you're going to be playing against those kind of teams. So uh, part of it is getting, getting your group ready for the season ahead and, you know, maybe even a few months later of what's, what's going to happen. 
but coach, uh, well, not right now in, in the Patriots League play, you're nine and two right now. Uh, just got to win over Lehigh. Uh, so, what's the key that went over Lehigh? Is just talk about how your team has been playing so far. So you got in the Patriots League and so tough schools you play against, like American, Boston University, Navy, Army. So it's, it's a tough league. So talk about uh, how you guys got off to a hot start, nine and two so far, and went over Lehigh uh, yesterday. Yeah. Um... You know, it, it, it is. It's a, like most every league. It's it's extremely competitive, and um, you know we've we've done a good job. We we got knocked off uh, by Lehigh at Lehigh, or pretty much a. I mean Lafayette at Lafayette, are pretty much a buzzer beater. And then, um, you know, we were a little bit undermanned. We had a guy out sick and a guy with an ankle. When they came back to our place, they got us again uh, two weeks later. Uh, but really, you're just preparing for the next game, and so um, you know whether it's a team that's you know. Uh, that's got, you know, three wins and is, you know, at the bottom of the pack or the team, you know, after this next game uh, uh, at home against uh, the Naval Academy, we'll go to Boston University and, you know, that'll basically be a, a fight for first place. Um, everybody, when you're, um, you know, had the good fortune to win the year before and you've been able to position yourself, like you said, a good non-league uh, record and, you know, at this place, at this point in first place, everybody wants to, to knock you off for one reason or another. So, you know, our focus has really just been that, especially as we get into February now, that you just got to be working to keep getting better and playing as well as you can together. Um, because, you know, every every day, as cliche as it sounds, every day matters. And, you know, every game matters to, you know, try and be, be there at the end of the regular season and in first place, um, you know, getting that goal done and, and securing home court for the, the conference playoffs. Uh, something that's really important in our league. And speaking of home court being an emphasis, I mean, you guys have done great at home so far. So how much do you discuss with your team about defending our home court and should we take care of home first before you go do anything else? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it some. I think the guys are, are extremely proud, as they should be. Um, you know, uh, when, when I got here um, you know, nine years ago, a, a home game, it, it, it wasn't crazy to play a home game in front of a couple hundred people. And, um, you know, now the, the institution and the student body and the local community has rallied behind us. You know, our, our gym doesn't really sit, fit more than probably, I don't know, 12, 1300. And to have around a thousand people at every game is significant. So I think the guys take great pride in that, um, in, in playing well at home for the fans. Um, it, the other part that we have talked about over the years is, you know, as you study programs that, um, you know, that, that compete for championships, not just that win one, but that are in the hunt that are, you know, programs that are really respected, you know, in their conference and outside of their conference, they have really good home records. They just, it's really hard to beat them at their place. So I I think if you develop that mindset of, you know, protecting your house and, and, and it being a difficult place for opponents to come in and win, um, then you've, then you're, you know, then you're knocking, knocking out one of those, one of those really, uh, important things um, to being a competitive, competitive college basketball program. Coach, last one I got for you is this: uh, I have to ask guys this question who have been coaching a long time. So I want to ask you as well: uh, Who have been some coaching individuals who really has helped you out in your career so far? Being a coach, and the coach business in general, has showed you the way and give, give you counsel when you need counsel and it's helped you kind of mold your program to what it is today. Yeah, um, it's a really good question, and I. I, I appreciate anybody who ever asked me that I, I think I was you know as I, I look back you know now going in almost a decade of being a head coach I, I was really fortunate um that I I you know num- first and foremost I played for um and then worked for for seven years uh, a coach named Fran Dunphy at the University of Pennsylvania and then at Temple University um and I, I learned about the business and about treating people the right way and doing things the right way and sometimes it, it might not behoove you or your program in the moment um, to make that choice uh, about a decision or a direction that you're going to go in or, you know, how you're going to, um, you know, you know, run your team or different things. Um, and, and I learned that, you know, from, from his, his tutelage, both, uh, you know, with, for me as a player, um, but also as a, as an assistant coach, um, you know, my time as a head coach, as, as I've gotten older, there's been a number of people, um, I've been really fortunate to have um, uh, my father uh, represented uh, Coach Doug Collins um, for a long time um, in his coaching and broadcasting career. So, you know, even as he's not been a coach anymore, just to, um, you know, use him as a sounding board of, 
of, you know, how, how do you, you know, coaching is a, a difficult profession and it's so cutthroat and, and determined on wins and losses, but you know, how to sustain the joy of coaching and impacting young people's lives. And, um, you know, not to always, especially when you're in the hunt, um, for a championship and you know how hard they are to win, um, that you're not just hanging on every, you know, made or miss shot or win or loss game that you're really, you know, concentrating on your process. So, you know, a number of people in my life, some of them coaches, some of them just former athletes, uh, some of them, to be honest with you, you know, administrators, um, who have just, you know, been able to provide perspective, um, you know, as, as most people in coaching are just so, so super competitive, uh, you know, about, uh, doing things the right way and, and, and the way that are, are staying true to your, your program and your organization and the institution you're representing that have really been, um, big, big, uh, parts of my, my career. Well, Coach Langle, thank you for your time today. Best of luck to you against Navy on Saturday here coming up here. Hope to talk to you again in March when you push tickets to the big dance again. Sign me up, man. I'll be ready to go. Sign me up. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Cole, thank you so much again for your time as always, buddy. All right, take care. Bye-bye. All right, that's Matt Langle on the Boss Man Show. Sally Beauty's new all-in-one hair color kits make it easy to color your hair at home. Get everything you need to color for beautifully radiant results. Loved by professionals, open to everyone. Sally Beauty. Folks, back here to the Boss Man Show here with Mark Garfrey, the coach of the Cal State Northridge Matadors. Coach, uh, you guys are grinding out there in the Big West, man. How do how you feel about your team so far? Our team has done really well. We, we started slow. We had a really good player that was out for about 12 games and uh, struggled. But then when he's, since he's been back, we've been good. So we're sitting here, I think, tied for third in the league and, um, you know, second half of the league getting ready to start. But we feel pretty good about things. Now, Coach, we talked last year when you first got hired. Uh, what has been the biggest improvements in your program since you and I last spoke last year when you first got, got this job at, at North Ridge? Well, I think a lot of things have changed. You know, like right now we're, we're leading the league in scoring. We've uh, defended pretty well. We, uh, You know, again, we've, we're 4-4 four and four in the league, and we're probably third, but we, we certainly could have been, you know, 6-2, and 7-1. and one. We've been right there in, in every game, so – our guys have really gotten better. They've improved. They're playing hard. They've got great energy. So uh, we just got to be able to finish this last half, uh, you know, in a good note. Now, Coach, speaking of improvement, play development piece, Coach, uh, this offseason, I know after your first year you want to set your culture. You know, you, you want to get guys used to what you what you want done. So in the spring, summer, and fall, what are some of the on-court and off-court things you do with your team to kind of get them prepared for this year in year two of your regime here at Cal State Northridge? Well, we spend a lot of time in the off season with our guys on the court. You know, you're limited a little bit by the NCAA, but you know, we try to maximize those hours. We try to get with each player individually. I think all of our players have gotten better. Um, you know, Lamine Janae is a Big West Player of the Year last year as a freshman. He's improved his game tremendously. Terrell Gomez is a great player for us in this league, and he's gotten a lot better. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that all of us as coaches we love to do is to help guys improve and, and uh, get better at their games. And, Coach, a, a piece of this, pot, this puzzle lot that gets overlooked by fans is the strength and conditioning piece because now it's so much more layered with the, 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 the nutrition piece of it, the sleep piece of it, along with the in the weight rooms to keep the guys from getting hurt as well. Well, we've hired a tremendous strength coach, Bob Alejo. He was at NC State when I was there the entire time. I think he's one of the best in the country. Uh, we've got a full-time nutritionist. Our athletic trainer's good. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the players have to accept some responsibility, too. It's like with their sleep habits and taking care of their bodies when they're not with us. Uh, but we feel like, um, you know, we've got a good group here that can help these guys get better. And uh, But, you know, sometimes, too, you can't be with them 24 hours a day. And we talk to them about all that stuff all the time. And part of that comes with recruiting good players, good kids, and guys that want to get better. And uh, we, but we feel like we've got a pretty good group here to do that. Speaking of recruiting, Coach, I feel like what you've been here in year two, uh, also heading year three here uh, after this year, Europe, so it's your relationships out west. It's your foothold out west. It's going to help you get even better players in your program to keep your program mm-hmm. st- steady and going. So how's that going out there with recruiting while trying to find in the, is, is the Well, the, it's, the it's been guys. good. It's been good. Southern California, there's a lot of players here. There's 600 high schools in Southern California. So there's a lot of players. And, uh, you know, our job is to find those guys that, 
sometimes might be falling through the cracks and uh, maybe get overlooked a little bit. We've done a pretty good job of that. But there's always good players here. We'd like to recruit the majority of our players from California. But, you know, if we have to go outside of there, we're fine to do that as well. But uh, And we got a good staff, Mo Williams, Jeff Dunlap, Jim Herrick, all three guys that are very good at what they do. And so we brought in some good young players, and now we just got to help get better. You kind of live into my next point about Coach Mo Williams. Uh, I know he's transitioning to coaching now from playing in the NBA all those years. So what is his experience of playing on the next level has helped you, a young man, who want to pursue that as either it be the NBA or you're playing for overseas as well? Well, Mo's, Mo's a great resource for these guys. He's a great teacher on the floor. He does a terrific job with these guys. And, and uh, there's so much knowledge and wisdom that he can uh, give to these young kids. I think it's been really beneficial for all of our players. Now, Coach, I know you didn't get as many wins you want to in the non-con, but you had to play those guaranteed games. You don't get many home games, so having all that travel. So having your guys get five wins in non-con has to make you not be so happy, but you know your guys got through it and they've bounced back, and like you said, the 4-4 four and four in league played now, whatever, right in the hunt there. Yeah, the, the non-conference schedule is hard here because, uh, you know, I've been at schools like Alabama and NC State where you could – you know, you could go buy in seven or eight teams that you're probably going to beat uh, and bring them into you your school for home games. And here we don't have that luxury. So we've got to be the team that goes on the road. And We played a tough schedule. You know, we were at New Mexico, at Auburn, at Richmond. We were at Green Bay. We were, we were all over the place this year, put a lot of miles in. We went to Portland and Portland State. So, you know, it, it makes it a little bit harder. But I also think those tough games like that made our team a little bit better. We're probably – you know, a better team now because of the schedule we played in the fall. You got that right. And what's, what's a thing or two you want to point out that you guys really improved on over the non-con as you, before you guys jumped into that big West play? Well, I think we learned uh, who we were, who we are as a team. And, uh, you know, when we share the ball really well, we're pretty good. We we defend better. We're pretty good. Um, you know, our team's one of those that uh, when we have great enthusiasm, so, I just think for us sometimes, uh, you know, those games are difficult. But at the same time, uh, that's the only way you get better, you know, is to is for somebody to expose you. And you have to learn how and what you want to get better at. So those games are very good for us. And, Coach, you used to say, say it so perfectly yourself. I feel like it gave you guys a big boost. And I, I feel like that toughness and adversity that you faced non-con, even you lost some tough games in conference play as well, it's really going to give these guys that bigger boost come late February and into tournament there where they won't feel like pressure or scared when it happens again. They get get executed for you in the, when the key moments there, when the counts in Anaheim. I think you're right. And uh, not only did we play a lot of road games in the uh, non-conference, our first eight conference games, we played five or eight on the road. So uh, hopefully uh, now we're, we've got eight left in the league. Five of those are at home. Then we've got the Big West Tournament. But not a lot that we haven't seen. We've seen a lot of different defense. We've seen a lot of different things. And I think all those things end up helping us. And also, you six to three, six to three at home, which is very important. Like you see, you only you haven't had many home games, but the win the ones you have at home is very important. The great you get those wins in the ledger to help you seeding wise in the Big West tournament, and also help you if you want to play after the, the tournament as well. I think so, and uh, you know we've been pretty good at times, and uh, but again, it's all about how you finish, and uh, we need to finish strong, finish well. Um, our guys, I think, are excited about it. We've got a game tomorrow with UC Riverside, and uh, they're much improved. They're a lot better than they were last year. I think we're tied with them in the league right now. So it starts tomorrow for us. Uh, we've done half the league. Now we've got the second half, and we need to do really well this last uh, eight eight regular season games. You got there, right, Coach? And speaking of that, of that stretch, uh, do you try to keep, keep your young men focused on it one game at a time? Because, you know, young, young kids – I always project and look ahead. So keeping their minds on this Riverside. We're not worrying about the last eight games. We're worrying about Riverside coming up here this weekend. Then we'll worry about that all these other teams down down the road. So I keep those guys focused on that, Coach. Well, we talk a lot about, you know, you, in our conference, there's 16 conference games, all 16. that They just count as one each. That's all. Sometimes you, you win a big game and you feel like it counts more than one or you lose one and you feel down in the dumps. But, Really, they're only one, one each, and uh, you got to take each game, and you've got to, you know, play each game as it's, it's the most important game on the schedule, and just take them one at a time. 
And coach, for you, how are you enjoying this, your time out there, out there in the Big West? No, this is your first time coaching the conference as a head coach out there. So, how are you, how is experience for you being being the Big West and seeing all different coaches in the league and all different things you see in the in, out in the Big West Conference? Why are you well, all together out there? Yeah, we've had a great time. Our staff has done a good job, and it's been a lot of fun. And you know, good coaches in this league. Dan Monson was at Gonzaga in, in Minnesota. Uh, Rod Barnes at UC Bake, uh, Bakersfield, they're coming into the league next year. But our league's done a good job, got good coaches, uh, good players in this league too, a lot, lot uh, better players than a lot of people think. So we've had a good time. It's been fun. It's been fun to be back in Southern California. And uh, I don't mind the 75-degree weather every day either. That's pretty good. <laughs> Coach, that's a great thing, especially today. The Atlanta wins snow here today, Coach. Believe it or not, it's snow here today. Believe it no, or not, Atlanta. No, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Coach, he did this morning. I was like, what just happened here? So <laughs> what you just said to me sounds so good. So funny if I was sunny every day. <laughs> yes, indeed, Coach. Well, Coach, uh, thank you for your time again, Coach. I appreciate okay. you coming on the show again. Hope to see you at the Final Four, Coach, as okay. well, man. All right, guys. Okay, thank you. All right, that's Mark Garfield on the Boss Man Show. How do you feel about your office? Is it just a space for your company, or is it a space to help you grow your company? From new HQs to satellite offices, with WeWork, you can find a space that works for you. Visit we.co slash space matters to learn more. All right, man, the Boss Man Show, as promised, he's back with us, my man in Memphis, J.C. Smith. What's good, bro? Oh, what up, what up? Man, no much, man. Off Super Bowl, high man, still... Amazed how my man Shanahan choked again, bro. Loving it, man. <laughs> Dude, I mean, the curse of Kyle Shanahan, man. Uh, this poor guy can't catch a break, man. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there like the rest of the country on Sunday, you know, up until what? The six minutes Seven minute more. Seven minutes more. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting up there thinking, you know what? The 49ers got this in the bag, man. They had played great defense up until that point, uh, pretty much containing Mahomes and putting that pressure on Mahomes with, with their uh, front four uh, defensive linemen there for the 49ers, man, those four uh, first-rounders that they had. So, like, the game plan was working, man, but it just seemed like on that third down with 30-15 play where Mahomes hit uh, Tyree Hill deep, you know, on that, like, post-corner route, uh after that, man, it, it was all she wrote. <laughs> you know, for the for the forty nine as the chief the chief there was able to come back, you know, uh from ten down and uh to win that game, man. So it has gotta be frustrating, gotta be disappointing, you know, uh for the forty nine to be a forty nine fan to think that you were just, you know, a few minutes away from your sixth Super Bowl in franchise history and you know, it's a lot of question marks that, you know, arise now. After that game, boss, you got to think about, you know, uh, like I said, Shanahan's decision making, you know, uh, going away from their strength of running the ball and trying to, you know, pass there, you know, a few times, uh, a pass a little bit more than uh, they normally were during those uh, uh, playoff games earlier uh, during this postseason run, man. And also, you no know, questions you have to ask about Jimmy G, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. You know, he had, he had his moment, but, you know, at two minutes, uh, you know, final two minutes of the game. He had a chance. They're down, uh, you know, down four, have a chance to score, score a touchdown to win the game. And, you know, it, the spotlight was on him, man, and he did not deliver. And that and it seemed like, you know, the question marks all season long about Jimmy G, it seemed like that moment was like his, his moment to answer all those questions, to show that he is the guy, he's worth, you know, all the money they're paying him, that he's a big-time, you know, quarterback in this league, man. But – he fell short. He almost connected on that deep pass to Emmanuel, Emmanuel Sanders to win the game. But, uh, I mean, I think, you know, you have to ask, like, okay, is he the guy that could get us over the hump? Yeah, we can win a lot of games, you know, with him during the regular season. You know, and, and he's shown with his regular season record so far that, you know, he's a more than capable starting quarterback. But does he have Does he have what Patrick Mahomes has? And Patrick Mahomes have been sticking up the joint for three quarters. You know, in that fourth quarter, you know he he shined. You know, when the pressure was on, when when the when the game was, you know, you know at stake. Patrick Mahomes, he showed you why. You know, he is who he is. And Jimmy Garoppolo had a chance to show who he truly is. And he left a lot of uh, you know, a lot of unanswered questions that have to, you know, have a lot of the 49ers fans scratching their head and in front of the office also 
as if the he is going to be the guy, you know, going forward in the future. Remember, Shanahan's like robots. Remember, they like Kirk Cousins. They like Rex Grossman. They like guys who don't go off script. But when in a big game, when you just want to go off script, you don't have it. So you want a robot as your quarterback, you're going to get a robot. You know, same thing with Matt Ryan with the Falcons. You know, they, you can't change the play in his offense. Whatever he calls, right. you go with it. That's why right. Matt LaFleur and Rodgers had a problem. LaFleur was like, well, let me let Rodgers change, change, change the plays. Because LaFleur comes from that Shanahan tree where whatever we call in the huddle, those two plays we call in the huddle, that's what you run. You don't change the right. what I call. And they want right. a robotic quarterback. So Mahomes will go off script a lot. Would not work for Cal Shanahan. He wants somebody who he can mow and 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 what do he says do. So part of it's their system and how they want to call the game. And so, but Shanahan, as usual, right? He tries to outthink himself. Same way he did with the Falcons and with the Patriots. Don't you could have just thrown the ball, or uh, you know, less could have run the ball. What you was doing? It was running the ball, killing them, and then you got conservative again, or you just try to outthink yourself. So. I think Shanahan got a question to answer, you know, in big games here. And Jimmy G did come up, so he had George Kittle open on throw down to five, but he went elsewhere. You know, but right. also, Chris Jones, the line for the Chiefs, he knocking down balls like crazy. You right. know, at the, right. end, at the end, they got their pass rush going. So, you know, I think the Chiefs just, just got high at the right time. But we come back from on Houston, 24 against Houston, down 10 to Tennessee, then down 10 in the fourth quarter to San Francisco. Hey, you deserve to win that game for sure. Yeah, you know, uh, well, like I said, you know, all all that being said, you know, uh, you know, it was a great game. Definitely late. Uh, it was kind of actually, you know, er, you know, early on, first first half, you know, it went, you know, as expected or whatever. Uh, but I really, really thought 49ers were gonna win that game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then I tell you about those, uh, you know, that, that Chiefs comeback. You know, uh, in the uh, with the, the conference. Uh, Divisional round and also uh, in the uh, conference championship game when they were when they got down big early double digits those comebacks they came you know like second quarter third quarter but the way the game was going you know on Sunday to do that in the fourth quarter man that was that was huge man because I I, th- I thought the game was over you by by that point in time in the game when Mahomes threw his second interception I did too thought, oh that was it yeah I did too you know. But for them to be able to turn it on, you know, in the uh, you know final minutes like that, man, that really shows the moxie of Mahomes and what that Chiefs team is really made of, man. And you know, I I, I seriously doubted that they could, they could do it, you know, at that point in the game, but they were able to do it, man. And Mahomes, you know, he he has like that Jordan esque type quality to him, you know, when the game's the biggest and when the pressure, you know, is really on, he's gonna find a way to uh, to deliver. It may not be the prettiest. But, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to get it done. You got there right. And switching sports all together, I, I, I saw where the young Grizzlies, uh, John Moran and D- Dylan Brooks, were still some shady. Andre Godala, who's decided not to mentor them, decided not to come to Memphis and be a part of what they got going on in Memphis. I can't blame him. Because, I mean, look at the Grizzlies roster. It's a surprise here at AFC right now. So I, I know why he didn't want to do it. He wants to go for championships, not – AFC didn't get swept, so I get it. But are we surprised that Ja and Dylan Brooks took, took shots at Iggy and Steph Curry jumped in and hitting, hitting Ja and, you know, and Ja hitting back with Steph Curry? And what are your thoughts on this whole little beef we have going on here over, over, over Iggy? I love it. I mean, you know, NBA drama, you know, so far from the NBA is, is the best thing ever, man. Uh, football season's over with now. Now we get the spotlight is totally on the NBA. Uh, as far as as far as Iggy is concerned, of course we know Iggy is not like this, you know, uh, elite player anymore. He, or, was he, he was never really elite per se, but he was a former All Star and a guy, a great wing defender. Of course, the Finals MVP who, who shut down, locked down LeBron a few years back. So it wasn't like he was going to make this big difference on our team. But and I can even understand, you know, I can even understand as far as. You know, when when, when uh, the Warriors dealt him away and he came here, you know, I can understand at that point, you know, of not wanting to play for the Grizz. Because, you know, everybody thought that the Grizz was going to be a, a rebuilding process, a team that was only going to win 20 games, and that was going to be it. 
So, of course, you know, a veteran who still think he has, you know, years left, we're not want to waste his time on a rebuilding team. But here's, here's where I find fault with Iggy, uh, Boss. At this mm-hmm. point, this is a, like I said, this the the rebuilding. This it's not a rebuilding uh program going on. This is a re- retooling program going on right now with the Grizz. Nobody thought that they would be able to do what they're doing. Twenty five and twenty five, AC in the Western Conference, uh, a couple games up, you know, on Portland and the Spurs right now. Nobody saw this, so it's like one of the best you know surprising stories in the NBA. So I was thinking that at least Iggy would see what's going on here. And like you know what, I I, mean, I want to be a part of this. I I want to be able to mentor Ja, mentor uh, Jaron Jackson, you know, and and help this team, you know, uh, in the playoffs, you know, because at that point he he said he wanted to be able to mentor young guys, and he feel like he still has you know a lot to you know give and teach. Why can't you do that in Memphis? Why do you have to go to L.A.? Why do you have to go to Houston? Why do you have to go to Miami? You know, once you see what's going on here in Memphis. Um, you know, so if I'm the Grizz, you know, um, I think they're they're doing the, the right thing. You know, you if this guy doesn't want to play for you and you're not able to find a trade partner and get a good deal, your guns and you know just let him stay out the rest of the year. You know, if he's not willing to, cause he, they say he's already received um, a great portion, majority of that portion of his contract. He's supposed to get 17 million this year. I think he's still gonna have, he only has like six million more to get. Uh, going forward, so if he's not willing to kind of concede and give give back some of that money, you know, for a buyout, you know, if you're the Grizz, you don't you don't give in to him. If he doesn't, if he's not willing to, you know, to play nice and you know, give give back something, a concession, then why why help him? Why buy him out so he can go to L.A. and then you have to play him the first round? You know, you might have to go up against him. So I think the Grizz are the Grizz are for for the first time in a long time. Are making great front office decisions now that Chris Wallace is out of there. Everything they've done so far in a year, they've hit on everything. They have not made a mistake on one thing yet. So that is like the biggest, you know, surprise in the world when you talk about being a Grizz fan and following the team for so long, and covering the team, man. The fact that the front office is sticking to their guns, they're not making dumb mistakes. They're making decisions that's going to set up the Grizz to be successful for years to come. That's the most wonderful thing, most wonderful thing in the world if you're a Grizz fan. And then as far as the uh, sniping going on and, and uh, everything on Twitter with Jai and Dylan and, and and Steph, it's awesome, man, because this new gen, next gen uh, Grizz, they're kind of like the old Grizz. They're kind of like the grit and grind Grizz. Like, they have so much love and, and, and show so much heart and appreciation for being in Memphis. Like, they, they appreciate the fact of the way, the way this town supports the Grizzlies. And, you know, they can buy into that. And John Morant, I don't see him being, you know, one of these free agents like Anthony Davis, you know, that, that wants to leave here after six, seven years. Like, Ja, I can easily see Ja being a, a Grizz his whole career. If they build around Ja and they're showing that they're going to do that, uh, build around Ja, build around Jaren, and, and, and build a contender and build a winner here, like, Ja Morant could be a guy who could be here his whole career. And, you know, I like the fact that he, he's showing heart as far as shooting back at Steph Curry. You know, Steph Curry tell him, like basically saying to pipe down, you know, uh, that Eagle Dollars the finals MVP and, you know, he, he, he like, you know, you can't say anything about him. No, nah. the Grizz see what's going on. They, they see that's a guy who doesn't want to be a part of what they have going on here. So, of course, they're going to shoot back because, you know, it's grit grind, man. You know, it's all heart. You know, that's what – this team, this, this city has been built on, and these new gen, next gen Grizz, they're just carrying that over now. It's like a passing of the torch. So, you know, if you talk about Memphis, or you, you know, we hey, these guys, they want all the smoke, <laughs> you know, and they are willing to clap back against any and everybody, no no matter if you're Steph Curry, a Finals MVP, or, you know, you're, you're Eagle Dollar. Like, anybody can get this work. <laughs> That's what the Grizz are saying right now. It's one of the old promotional things that Memphis versus everybody. I remember one of the old promotional things they used to do with Memphis, the Grizzlies, Memphis versus everybody. I guess that's the way it is now. If you ain't with Memphis, basically, you against us. You know, Memphis versus everybody at the Fags Forum there. Now, bro, this is what I think going to happen. I think you're going to end up back, end up back with Golden State again, eventually after the season is over. He's going to go out to Golden State probably. I guarantee you if I go back to Golden State, mm. something mm. tells me it's going to happen. It can happen. It can definitely happen, bro. Uh, like I said, you know, trade deadline, 
It's Thursday. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tuned in, man. I cannot wait to see what happens. And like I said, there's a lot of other stuff going on also in the league as far as trade deadline. Like, what's going to happen with Clint Capella in Houston? Are they going to deal him, you know, uh, to, to a contender, to another team? And also, you know, the uh, Jim Wolves are making some real uh, – Robert Covington, my book for TSU. Yeah. yeah, you know, what's going on with Covington, man? What's going to happen with him? And then also, you know, Timberwolves are trying to get D'Angelo Russell from Golden State. They're trying to, you know, pair him up with Carl Anthony Towns in Minnesota, man. So it's going to be a lot of intriguing things going on. Andre you know, Drummond, every, Derrick Rose, yeah, Luke Kennard, Drummond, yeah. John Collins yeah, with the it, Hawks, Evan Turner with absolutely. the Hawks. Man, it's, it's a lot. You know, normally we say it's a lot, you know, a lot of buzz about what's going on, what's going to happen in the trade deadline. And then a lot of years, you know, we don't really get much, much action. I think this year – we're going to get some action, boss. I think it's going to be some notable names being moved, you know, and, and guys being moved, contenders and teams getting rid of guys to shed salary, you know, to make moves in the future. I'm excited about Thursday to see what happens. Bro, I think the NBA made a mistake. You know, when the trade deadline was doing, a, like, after the All-Star break, I think what the NBA panicked that year, the Cousins got traded during the All-Star game. They panicked and moved it up two weeks. Because, so, teams don't know if they buy the seller still, if you if you ask me. They don't quite know yet. They're kind of at no man's land. But you give them t- two more weeks, they'll know. But they panicked after that Cousins incident. And now they, it's two weeks earlier, teams don't know whether they really buy the sellers right now, if you ask me, bro. Absolutely. You know, a lot of teams are kind of, you know, in that, in that mix right now. Um, you know, but like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, man. I cannot wait to see what happens. On uh, on Thursday, man, you know, with Eagle Dollar, with all these other guys also. NBA, man, you got to love it. Yes, indeed. Well, bro, I, last week said me, look here, bro, this, you coming back, generate to get this 707, okay, 79,100 listings to your segment returning, brother. So, brother, you were missed. I'll tell you that, brother. The people missed you, man. Hey, man, hey, boss, I'm back, baby, 2020. <laughs> I'm back with a vengeance. We're going to do big things in 2020, man. Look out. You might you might see the J.C. Boss Man Show coming to a radio station near you, man. You just never know, man. You never know, folks. Never like my man said, bro, hey, hold it down Memphis, bro. I'll see you March the 7th, bro. I'm coming to Hawks. Grizzlies, I'll beat the fans for him, bro. I'll see you, man. Can't wait for that, man. Man, let's get it. No doubt, folks. My man, J.C. Smith, on the Boss Man Show. Grab a hold of big breakfast flavor at Hardee's. Try two breakfast sliders for just $2.99. Get Applewood smoked bacon or freshly grilled sausage with fluffy eggs and golden melty cheese all on a toasty little bun. Good morning, start at Hardee's. Available now for a limited time at participating restaurants. Tax not included. Foles back on the Boss Man Show. Time with the Boss Report with my man Bone. Bone, what is good up in the New Jersey tri-state area, my good brother? Ashley. My man, boss man, it's uh, seasonably warm up here, uh, so it's not bad. And I'm happy that I'm back for a second week. Happy to have my contract renewed. Uh, I know there's a certain person in the great state of Milwaukee <laughs> that doesn't want to hear that, but I'm glad to be back. Yes, indeed. And uh, but before we get to the boss report part of the Florida boss report, what's your thoughts on the Super Bowl uh, this past week with Kansas City coming back? on the 49ers and shutting her hand choking like somebody else we know again. Yeah, that, that choke job is real with Shanahan. Yeah, I figure it was already against him because, first of all, he's Kyle Shanahan. He has a penchant for blowing leads in Super Bowl. And second, I just realized that uh, about midseason that he had Wes Welker on his staff. And we all know if you're a football fan, Wes Welker is the anti-Lombardi. Wherever he goes, his teams do not win Lombardi's. Uh, so they had uh, they already had it in for them already with that fact, but then you throw in Jimmy G doing Jimmy G things in the fourth quarter, and and they're just doomed. Yeah, they were doomed, and Patrick Mahomes did what he did. Uh, you know, I'm not the biggest Patrick Mahomes fan in the world <laughs> for other reasons, but yeah. I'm glad the Big Red got him a title. Andy Reid's a cool yeah. guy. I, I like. Oh him yeah, and Andy Reid is one of the wokest guys in the NFL. Uh, in, in a league that is full of uh, of the same whitewashed retreads, and Andy Reid is real, and I love Andy. So for that, I'm not that mad. Uh, but as a Broncos fan, I could never root for the Chiefs. I could never appreciate Mahomes on the field. 
Uh, as you said, you're not a fan for other different reasons. And I, you know what? Uh, there are some things that I'm not a fan of either. But uh, I don't think that he was also an MVP either. He was not the MVP of that game. So uh, I, I know it's a QB-driven league. So obviously he got the MVP award, but he didn't deserve that MVP award. Should have been Damian Williams. Exactly. I'm with you, brother. And postscript of that was the idiot president did not know that the Kansas City Chiefs plays in Missouri, not Kansas. <laughs> Congratulations the great people of Kansas on the Chiefs winning. What a dodo bird. Yeah, and I, I hope your listeners realize when I said in the opener, the great state of Milwaukee, I was taking a shot at our president and, and our president junior in Milwaukee. I, I know Milwaukee is a city. I wasn't saying Milwaukee is a state on, on, by accident. It was on purpose, uh, listeners. Uh, so don't think that I, I, I'm I'm a Trumper. So I, I'm not. So please. And where did Trump move to, Bone, officially? Where did he move to? <laughs> Well, if you ask me who Trump Jr. is, Trump Jr. is now Milwaukee. Well, well, but but but, but, but where did Trump move to officially now? He's down in Washington. Now he moved to Florida officially, so he's oh, a Florida that man. Right. Oh, that's so, right. so, 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 so a Florida <laughs> man mistakes team state in victory. Congratulations, tweet. <laughs> we have Florida. Oh. Hola, uh, that was a great segue. I apologize for Buddy, and that was a tremendous segue. And I messed it up. I apologize. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So it works right into the show. Florida <laughs> man, <laughs> mistake state, football team wins, and a horror, horrific tweet. That's a story that I just made up on the fly because the Dodo Bird moved to Florida officially now. <laughs> that is correct. That is, that is a great point. Yes, indeed. Well, folks, you've been waiting on it. It's time for it. It's here. It's the Boss Report. First story bonus is Odie Bagooty Classic, Florida man arrested after Walgreens I gave him a prescription for some Viagra. In return for that, he cuts off his junk, shoots the pharmacist down because he wouldn't give him any Viagra. So he wouldn't give any Viagra so that he gunned down his poor soul. Yes, he cut his own junk off after, after he shot the pharmacist. I, I don't... <laughs> this place. I don't understand, like, the rationale of these Florida men that cut their own junk because they're mad at someone else. I will never understand that fully. Or at all. I'll never understand that rationale where you're so pissed off at someone else that you will mutilate your own self. Uh, yeah, it's probably that. If you gun somebody down, that's tragic. But then they cut up your own junk. I mean, cool. so you're already going to jail, and now you're going to jail without anything down below. <laughs> yeah, you have a now have a bag the rest of your life, my man. That's horrible. So, yeah, not good. Um, Florida woman arrested after smearing dog crap on her fiance's face as he will take out the trash. Oh, kudos to now being a Florida woman. So we're all about equality here. Uh, so a woman gets on on, on the on the show. Uh, I want to know: Did she use her own hands? Did she use like one of those doggy bags or like like what? She used her hand. That's she used gross. her hand. That's gross. So so you're mad at the guy being like filthy and pig size because he won't take out the trash. Yet you you leave dog feet on your hands. So you're kind of defeating the purpose of, of being clean and organized in your own house. Exactly. Does not add up one bit. She threw me with that one. Um, Florida man flees cops so fast after robbing a win Dixie. Some of his clothes came off. Please identify him via DNA on his dirty, bloody sock. A dirty, bloody sock. What was, what was he doing with his sock? Got so bloody. Maybe to run on the rocks, maybe running on the ground. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> but, but wait, he ran so fast his bra came off? Yes, everything came off. Yeah, you know, that kind of speed, if Al Davis was still alive, he would sign him. <laughs> Uh, yes, he Jones would. Might, Jerry Jones might sign him, though. If Jerry Jones, he's that kind of speed where you run so fast, your draws come off. Jerry Jones might, might, might get you a deal. Yeah, he might get a deal. And, you know, that's crazy. He was truly blowing the wind. He truly was blowing <laughs> the wind for real. Like, my man was out there. Man, <laughs> oh, man. Get this. Florida man uses 
Wisconsin woman's debit card information to buy pizza at Pizza Hut. You know what? This hits close to home, all right? Because about eight years ago, I I was a victim of fraud. And I when they uh, called me about the fraud and they showed me uh, the receipts, I was indeed uh, a victim of a dude going to some outpost. He went to uh, Pizza Hut. He went to Walmart. So, so I, it kind of hits close to home with that. But this dude, this, these idiots, they're going to go buy pizza with his stolen cards. The dude that got me, he did it in Kentucky. So he wasn't necessarily a Florida man, but I guess it's close enough. These, these idiots, don't they know that things get tracked now? Especially these damn chips they got in, in, in these, in these uh, cards now. Like, come on. Exactly. And you go, I mean, if you want to splurge, why is Pizza Hut atop your list? Exactly. Try something better. It has to be something better than that. I'm be sure. a better thief. Really, be a better thief. Come on. Get this. Florida man pumps 30 gallons of gas into cockpit a fishing boat rather than the gas tank due to, quote, unseasonably warm temperatures and meth, says no word on whether he tried to steer the boat back by climbing to the fuel tank. So he pulled all the gasoline in, in the boat? Yes, not the gas tank. Oh, dear Lord, I hope that ha- I hope that guy had a cigarette with the bar on him. A lit one at <laughs> that. That would have been a lesson learned indeed. He said he had meth. He had meth due to hot temperatures. It says we hot temperatures in Florida. This is the uh, 90s. That's the key word. When you're talking about Florida men doing dumb stuff. You got that, that, that M word in there. Oh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense now. Get this. Anti-Trump Florida man likes to protest with his F Donald Trump golf cart outside of the most Republican Florida villages. His FTD golf cart features signs such as Hitler and Trump have the same DNA. Trump is a sexual predator. Huh. So this guy was going on with anti-Trump stuff? Yes. And he's doing it in Florida? Yes, he is. Ooh, that boy better be careful. That, 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 is, that is Trump's uh, clientele. That's his people down there. That boy better be careful, man. Yes, indeed. Now, Bone, last week we talked about the folks in Iguanas last week, remember? We talked about that last week. Yeah. Now, another story. Here we go. Entrepreneurial. Florida man turns its rain frozen iguanas situation into, hey, everyone, who wants some of my delicious iguana broth? This is like chicken soup. He's selling iguana broth now. So he's boiling these things alive because he doesn't know these iguanas aren't necessarily dead yet. They're just like in a Correct. deep sleep. Or so he's boiling these, these guys alive. But they, they get this bone. They came with life in the water because they were so hot. Oh, my goodness. That is amazing. And that reminds you of the story last week, right? <laughs> they, they, yes! They, and they came alive in the car, right? Yes! Ooh, boy. You put them in the boiling hot water, they're going to wake up. They're back in temperature yeah. again. Yeah, they're like, they're like, oh, shoot, what's going on here? And they, <laughs> they're trying to bounce out of there. Boy, why my state? Why, why, why? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Get this. Florida woman arrested for punching neighbor but I invite her kids to the birthday party of their of their daughter. So she punched the neighbor because her kids didn't get invites? Yes. You know what? I've seen that stuff up here in New Jersey, in Patterson, in Newark, and everything, East Orange. So, <laughs> so it, it's not exclusive to, to, to Florida. But uh, it, it just it does sound like 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 a Florida thing also because down there it's almost it's almost lawless down there. I, I, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you got that right. Get this: Florida man arrested after swallowing a bag of meth, stealing a, a, a patrol car, and crashing while fleeing. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry that all your equipment saying yes on my breath immediately. Because <laughs> you say meth, it, it means something. Man, it's just it's popping off. I, I love what Mets involved in these stories because it makes things add up. It makes things more sense. Even the non things, even things that are nonsense and don't make sense, it makes sense and have Mets involved. Yes, indeed. And get this: Florida woman 
opera singer sings on top of SUV and proceeds to drive through the gates of Mar-a-Lago and get shot at by the cops. <laughs> so wait, a lot of things right here. See, I know I said things about, about don't make sense. This right here, so she sings <laughs> opera, right? So you might on top think of an SUV. She might have a little class to her if she sings opera, right? But then you yes. think the back of a pickup truck? Yes, through the gates of Mar-a-Lago. They get shot at by the police. What ilk is she? What of uh, 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 what uh, you know? Ilk is, is, is an opera singer. If you want to less season, the less season. Uh, ah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Because uh, I never really hear stories about the other ilk getting shot at, and, and they could do the most grimiest thing and, ha- and have firearms on possession and never get shot at. So that's interesting that he actually got shot at. Consider who she was, but the, the story that makes make sense at all is the fact that she's singing opera and she's out of a pickup truck. That is, is she a traveling circus? Ah, uh, that part I do not know, bro. <laughs> that part I don't have on that one. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was pretty wild there. And uh, uh got two more for you. Uh, Florida man gym teacher arrested for farting on students and quote. I want to show them how gas works. Ha! That reminds me of the story about Antonio Brown doing the same thing to his doctor. To his, his same doctor that, that checked him out. So, uh, the, he teaches like uh, a lesson on gas, huh? The gym teacher. Yeah. Why don't you just roll out some balls and tell the kids to go play? Why are you farting on my, on my kid? I swear, if that was my, my son's gym teacher... I'm coming down there and I'm catching a case. I really am. Because why are you farting on you, uh, you, you kids? Crazy, right? Like that's just out of control. <laughs> and and the the last one I got for you is Florida man arrested hunting frozen iguanas caused a school lockdown because he saw the frozen iguanas all, all in on on the trees and hanging, kind of shoot shoot them, shoot at them. <laughs> shoot at the trees on school property and got called <laughs> locked down. He's shooting at a quad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Off the, well, I, off the you know what? Gun violence is terrible. Gun violence on school grounds is even worse. But this fool is actually shooting at iguanas, like lizards. But like he's shooting at reptiles <laughs> on school grounds. There's, there's got to be something involved. There's got to be alcohol. There's got to be meth involved in that, in that story. It's got to be. It's got to be. That is out of control, man. That's out of control. So, Bone, what is your take on today's boss report, man? What have you heard today that's really going to stick with you? It's always outrageous when you hear about, about mess involved. I like that. And anytime a mess gets involved in one of these stories, I, I feel warm inside because it's just all right in the world. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, the iguana stories crack me up. I mean, because I know I, I'm not even I'm not even from Florida, so I knew about the frozen iguana. Like iguana. So I'm not even from the area, and I know what that means. Co- you know, come when get cold weather and they freeze up and, and almost getting like almost like a state of shock. So I know this. So how are these Floridians not knowing this and they're panicking at this? Or you're trying to hunt them off the trees at schools, or you're <laughs> trying to cook cook them as chicken soup, and they come alive in the boiling water, and he freaks you out. Like these what are Elmer you doing? Fudd wannabes, that, that's amazing. They're hunting iguanas. Be very, very quiet. <laughs> oh my god, my state no disappoints, man. <laughs> no disappoints, my state, man. Oh man, Florida. I would say do better, but I need to keep doing what you do. I, I need show content, so keep doing what you do, Florida. Please, don't ever change. Please. <laughs> right, really. So, Florida, stay you. Be you. Thank you. Be you. So, folks, Boss and Bone, Boss Report. We out. And if you don't know, now you know, you know.